you guys have neck or back pain, so just bear with me. It may happen at some point. And I really like giving these talks because, um, and, and I acknowledge there's some of my patients out there. You've had, heard a lot of this talk, so um, I, I hope I don't disappoint you. But I think one of the goals is the same thing I try and do in clinic, and that's um, just do some basics in how we all got here or will get here at some point and you know what is what are the things that I'm looking for if we're, or if you come in and visit me how are we going to address your problems and that way hopefully people who haven't seen me or you know uh, hopefully never have to see me have better expectations of what it is that we do what it is that we're good at um, what it is that um, we commonly will direct you to so you know, you might come to me with more realistic expectations or sort of a, a, a nodding acknowledgement that, yeah, okay, you told us about that in that lecture. Um, so let's get started. Um, Down. Down okay. So, so these are some of the things we'll talk about. It, and it's just, again, sort of basic expectations and basic anatomy. You don't have to know medicine and you don't have to, um, understand spine surgery, but I do want to um, sort of illustrate some of the common things so you have a better baseline level of knowledge. And then um, some of the red flags that, that would tell you, I definitely got to go see Dr. Child because, because of that. That's good. Um, and then when? When should you look at that? So let's, let's just start with the neck and then we'll go to the low back. And I just want to do some real basic stuff. So your skull should sit up here, and this is um, your neck, or uh, a prototype of your neck. These are the bones in your neck, and in between them are the discs. There's probably a lot of people who do mechanical stuff and, and recognize these as sort of like bushings that separate the bones in your neck and give them space, give them cushion, and give them motion. One of the other things they do, if you notice these yellow things, and Unfortunately, the body doesn't color code these things for me, or in my life would be easier. But it gives space for the nerves to exit at each level. And we have uh, more or less the same wiring. Uh, and each of these nerves does the same thing in us, and they, go, they do different things. So when I'm listening to you, I'm correlating your symptoms to this mental knowledge of what you're made up of. Um, and, and this is the, the common uh, imaging that we'll get in the clinic. So often I'll have an x-ray first and we'll talk about the structure of your spine because as it turns out, x-rays and MRIs tell me different stuff. X-rays, hard stuff, um, like bone. MRIs, soft stuff, like discs, spinal cord, spinal fluid. Um, and so many of you have heard this speech as I'm scrolling through your MRI, but this is again your neck. This is the front of your neck, this is the back of your neck, your face is up here. This is the weight-bearing portion of your spine. We all have seven cervical vertebrae with these discs in between. Um, and then they make a bony arch, just like you saw in the last picture, around the spinal cord and the nerves. To protect it, um, if we want to think of why it's there, but um, the spinal cord runs down the center of this. The, that's the dark line, and the bright line is spinal fluid, which if you look on this view, really surrounds it. It's like your spinal cord is swimming in this nice, healthy bath of spinal fluid, which gives it protection, it gives it nutrients, and um, then when we look at your particular neck, and again, this thing's cutting in and out, your particular neck might look great like this one does, or it might have a small disc bulge like this one happens to. That disc bulge can be incidental. Lots of people have bulging discs and have no symptoms. Some people have bulging discs and significant symptoms. That's why you'll hear me spend the, the beginning of every one of your patient visits just talking with you and listening. Because the first thing I want to know is why you're here and what are your symptoms. I don't treat MRIs, I don't treat x-rays, I treat people with symptoms. And I don't care if your MRI looks like somebody uh, stuffed a hand grenade in there and let it go off. If you don't have symptoms, I don't want to touch it. And, and that's the basic of it. I treat you, not this. So it, you'll often see us not requesting an MRI before we see you because I want to uh, use it appropriately and give knowledge that makes sense for 
you, the individual. The low back is a similar arrangement. Again, we have these weight-bearing bones separated by discs with nerves that come out at each level. Um, the, the disc is made of soft, spongy material that gives you cushion. It separates these bones uh, here so that the nerves can easily and freely exit. And they all, again, have separate roles and separate functions. For instance, um, let's say someone of you uh, comes in with pain that radiates down the outside of your leg, around the lateral aspect of your uh, calf, into the dorsum of your foot. Um, you might even have weakness in lifting your big toe up. I'm going to listen to that and say, okay, what you're describing to me is the L5 nerve and its symptoms. And so what we're going to be looking for then when we go to your x-ray is how does the L5-S1 or the L4-5 level look, both which can affect that nerve, and do they start to tell the same story as you do? Then we'll go to the MRI and again look at the same sort of arrangement and see, you know, does this L4-5 disc herniation which is pushing on the traversing L5 nerve nicely explain your symptoms. And that's the way it should work out. I should listen to you and you should tell me a story that then I have an internal dialogue uh, going on with myself and then to you. We look at the imaging that supports what you've told me and now we've got a plan that makes sense. One of the common things we find is things that can intrude in our normal anatomy. So this is the way this, what we call an axial image, looks like. This is that bone we saw in front. This is the nerves within the neural canal. Each one of these little black dots is a nerve swimming in spinal fluid. These are two of the nerves exiting out and running down to your legs. Um, this uh, is, a, is the same level, but Thickening of the joint and arthritis has crowded this space, and so now that normal, robust area of spinal fluid signal is gone. And these nerves are all being pinched, and that can cause symptoms that, that we recognize very well long before I've seen this MRI. That is spinal stenosis. So the first thing I have to do, whether I'm talking to you guys, or there are, um, last Friday I was given this lecture, not this lecture, but a, a lecture to residents and fellows in spine surgery, future <coughs> spine surgeons, and it's just to relax. Even people who are orbiting my field or in orthopedics, the moment I use the word spine or the moment I, I tell somebody like, uh, I'm doing X, Y, or Z thing to a spine, this threat level goes up because people associate spine with well, that causes paralysis, and, and people can uh, then be in wheelchairs and be fed with tubes. And the, the end result is your spine is a lot like your knee, your hip, your ankle. And, and it doesn't have this severe threat level associated with, us, with it that makes us um, cringe at everything we do with it. Actually, it has some pretty fundamental rules. It's pretty durable. You've been walking around with it all your life and done just fine. And so it's a pretty robust structure that we can all just relax a bit with when we're describing and talking about it. As it turns out, neck and back pain are fairly common. Roughly 80 to 100 percent of us are going to have severe debilitating neck or back pain in our lives. So, it's, it's something we're all going to deal with to some extent. Some of us, unfortunately, much more than others. Um, we have this description or term of mechanical neck pain because, unfortunately, even though there's all the above, um, I think we're losing a battery or something. Um, even though we have all the above problems that can happen in the neck and, and we're going to have a similar list for the low back. Um, it's quite often that I meet people daily in clinic who have um, really significant symptoms and none of the above. Um, and there's a whole lot more pain generators I could list off that are responsible for neck or back pain. And it's actually more common than not that we can put our finger on that and say, this is what, where your neck or back pain is coming from. And that's one of the challenges. I'm, I'm put in a position as a spine surgeon of, and, and uh, Allison and Greg of trying to vet those things, run through a lot of the common things that commonly help people, and hopefully we arrive at some good solutions for you. Worst case scenario, there are surgical solutions, but, but what you want out of us is 
is to reserve A, the surgical stuff as your last resort, and B, well vet this stuff so that we're not rushing forward to the next step. And, and more than anything you want out of me, even if you have debilitating pain with no identifiable cause, mechanical problem, or things, quite honestly, that we can alter or fix, to tell you that everything's structurally strong, everything looks good, uh, I know you're hurting, here are the common things we can do for it, but what you don't want is me mucking around in your neck or back just because. You want me to offer you something of value. Um, because once we head there, then we have, we have other things we've got to consider. Again, similar list for low back pain, this time with a little bit better evidence uh, but behind the, the frequency of when we actually identify these things. And you notice lumbar sprain and strain, much like neck muscular strain and sprain, occupies the vast majority of these. This is mm -hmm. ultra common, um, and yet really has no identifiable markers on an MRI or on an x-ray or on a, a, a test that um, Greg or Allison can administer. And so it's common. Many of us, if not most of us, get it, and, and, and it's difficult to deal with. Um, Radiculopathy, radic is Latin for root. That just means the nerve root. And so when we say radiculopathy, which you might find popping up in some of your charts or, or descriptions of, of you, is radiating arm or leg pain. When we think it's caused by pressure on one of those nerve roots I showed you. And again, going back to my mental picture that I have when I talk with you guys, um, they all go different places. So for instance, if you have a C4-5 uh, disc herniation in your neck that's pushing on the C5 nerve, you see it's going to radiate out to the uh, upper chest and shoulder area, not going much farther down the arm, and, and that's it. So that's the patient who's going to come in, and they're going to first, before I've seen any of that imaging, describe, you know, I've got this pain in my neck that's kind of burning and radiates out to my shoulder. Um, it, it, it's just debilitating. And that's a C5 nerve distribution problem. And you know, correspondingly, just like I was talking about with the lower uh, <coughs> extremities, there's muscles associated with all those nerves too. And all of this should add up. It's like a, 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 a puzzle that we put together. And if it doesn't add up, then we've got to invoke other things. Some of you might be referred for an EMG because all the points don't line up perfectly. They don't have this one-to-one -one correlation between your <laughs> symptoms and your pain and your imaging. And so I reach out for other studies to try and help like a good lawyer build a case where I know where your pain is coming from. But we don't like lawyers. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, and, and this is what some of that might look like. So this is a disc herniation that's kind of come through the soft part of the disc and it's pushing uh, against one of these nerve roots. And if we had C2 to localize, we'd say this is about C4-5, and that would press on the C5 nerve and, and cause you pain like we just talked about. Same thing um, applies in the low back. I, I can't tell you how often I hear the term sciatica and, and just know that that internally trips a wire in my brain to say, okay, but what nerve are we talking about? Because sciatica is the lumbar nerves uh, uh, L4 through S3. Um, and any one of those can cause pain. Any one of those or several of those can be pinched and they'll run down the sciatic nerve. They all join together, run down a bundle, but they retain their identity. So if it's pushing on the L5 nerve, that's sciatica, but it'll go down, like I said, outside of the leg to the top of the foot. If it's pushing on the S1 nerve, it's going to run down the back of the leg to the bottom of the foot. Um, and you can have mixed patterns because you're pushing on more than one leg. And by the way, you're your body didn't necessarily read the anatomy book, so there's individual variants. People are about 70% right when they're describing their pain. 30% of the time, they're off by one level. Um, and this is just a similar diagram. The disc herniates and pushes on the nerve. That's one of the reasons you can have pain, but not the only one. And again, this is sort of what I'm talking about. And some of you, um, usually when I give this talk, you're, you're out there nodding your head like, yeah, that's, that's where my pain is. That's where my pain is. Um, but like I said, there's, um, as we scroll through 
various anatomic diagrams which aren't meant to make sense to you. There's just tons of things in the spine that can cause pain. There's the facet joints in the back, there's the ligaments that attach between bones, there's the muscles that attach to ligaments, there's the disc, there's the nerves that uh, go around the disc, there's nerves that go to the joints, there's, and the list goes on and on for about a good 20 or 30 structures. And sometimes it's difficult putting our finger on which structure is causing your pain. Um, one of the common ones, and I cover this just because we see it so often, and again, this is the head nodding uh, portion of the talk, is spondylolisthesis. Um, it's actually a really common thing for several reasons. One, it's common in adolescents, especially uh, teenagers who do uh, hyperextension type sports, ex gymnasts, ex football players, down linemen, um, and just unfortunate adolescents who develop a stress fracture in the back portion of their spine between the upper joint and the lower joint. Um, and in many of those cases, it heals. I know my own son, uh, we got a CT scan of him. He had a spondylolysis, put him in a brace, and his healed. But many, many more, um, women more than men, women more at this L4-5 level, men more at the L5-S1 level, get this stress fracture, and it goes unnoticed. They had back pain. Um, maybe they were taken. Um, uh, seriously, an imaging obtained but didn't show it. Maybe they just felt like, hey, you'll outgrow this, and they did. And then, usually in the fourth to sixth decade, for whatever reason, these ligaments or, or unhealed stress fracture start to loosen up, and it allows, it allows those bones to slip forward. And when they do, remember, this isn't empty in you. There's a nerve that's coming through here. There's other things that are associated with this degeneration as it slips forward. And this can often be a dynamic slip. You bend forward, it slips forward, you bend back, it reduces. And so people's pain can be modified by what they're doing. Um, and we see this, you know, five to ten times a clinic. Um, so spondylolysis is the fracture, and then you might hear spondylolisthesis, which printed out a little poorly, and that's the slippage forward. Um, this can happen for other reasons. It doesn't have to be a stress fracture. Sometimes your joints just get worn out and loose, and so there's less slippage, but still uh, functionally important and can cause just as much pain. And there's other reasons for that separation and slipping to happen, but they'll scare you, and I won't talk about them right now. <laughs> and they're super rare. Um, and that's uh, sort of an x-ray where um, if I bend this patient forward, this bone slips forward, and if I bend them back, it reduces in place. This is the thing, uh, I think one of the reasons why people consider spine care such a minefield is, is you say the word spine and automatically people think, well, do you mean cancer in my spine? Do you mean infection? Um, uh, or things that are going to put me in a wheelchair? And, and just note, this is, this is less than 1% of all spinal problems. Part of my training, um, some of you might know my background is in uh, oncology. I, I did a separate year of fellowship in musculoskeletal oncology, so my practice is a lot more than 1% of all back pain, but, um, but still, this is very infrequent, uncommon. This isn't you, unless, um, you know, some people do win the lottery and some people are unfortunate enough to have some of these bad problems. But I really put this stuff up to show you that it's, it's super uncommon. And, and even when it is, this is an example of a patient I saw who had what uh, we thought was a spinal tumor. Um, I have an algorithm that I go through in my, in my head in my practice. We biopsy this patient, and the biopsy actually shows the opposite. Well, it has inflicted a lot of pain and destruction on this spine. This is actually gout in the spine. And this patient, um, once we obtained the diagnosis, said, you mean that same thing that caused swelling in my toe 30 years ago? Yes, that. Um, and then there's mimickers. You can have back pain and groin pain and thigh pain, and it may have nothing to do with your back at all because there are pelvic disease, uh, kidney problems, um, and vascular problems that can all refer to the back and flank and legs, and that um, 
There's also a fair amount of the cause of back pain, but again, still a pretty insignificant amount when we take them all together. This is uh, a list that I need to remember, not you, but just under. <laughs> Just read fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and it essentially se uh, se speaks to the fact that some of you bring more to the table than others. So as we get older, we do become a little more susceptible to some of these problems, arthritis being chiefly among them. But also some of the other things. Um, infection might get a little more likely because our immune system is as, as robust. Inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis can accumulate over time and cause problems. Um, uh, but, but my point is that um, some of these more uncommon problems are in patients who bring more to the table. Um, obviously, if you have a history of cancer, spinal malignancy becomes more of a, of a question mark in our head that we've got to solve for us. Um, and I look for specific things. So most of you, 99% of you, will come to clinic and talk about um, symptoms that are f easily recognizable, very familiar to me. But should one of you come into the clinic and start saying, yeah, but the problem is, is I get this pain, and day or night doesn't go away. I've, I've lost 40 pounds. I ain't on no diet. Um, I, I uh, uh, am on immunosuppressive drugs for a kidney replacement. I um, have this numbness or tingling and to be uh, uh, indelicate. I've been losing control of my bowel and bladder function. These are all red flags that when I hear them, then uh, different spells tick in my head and then we do something else. But all pretty uncommon. Um, because um, the vast majority of back pain is ultra common and so like I said, I think it's, it's um, fair to say that most of us will have back and neck pain in our lives, but as far as severe, uh, perhaps, emergency room reportable type back pain, uh, we're still in the 60% range or so. Um, so who does it happen in? And, and I get this a lot, like, and, and mostly in the affirmative, like people will say, yeah, yeah, I know I have back problems because I was a lineman with a telephone company or um, I beat up my back, I ski bumps all my life, in which case I am totally hosed. Um, but in reality, if there's one thing, um, and these are all things, yes, heavy laborers have more back pain. Yes, if you carry a lot more weight on your core, you have more back pain. Um, if, if you don't take enough care of yourself and your core strength is weak, yes, you can have more back pain. Um, but the reality is, is that most of it probably more affected by where you came from and who's your parents. So if you want somebody to blame or somebody to point the finger at, <laughs> you know who to talk to. Um, so um, some of this is, is a little bit a academic and I don't want to get hung up on it, but um, just know that uh, one of the things the Wellness Center is promoting is sort of this multimodal holistic approach to your pain because let's face it, the mind-body thing's a real thing and it matters. It matters for your outcomes and it matters for your pain and how you deal with it and the data is ultra clear that these things intrude on how we um, on how we interpret our pain and how we deal with it and honestly even in the presence of, of um, I think we have a few more papers, um, even in the presence of good surgery affects it. So what do we do? We, we also incorporate a lot of those mindfulness, mind-body treatments into what we do because it matters. It may not be a game changer for you and it may not be an end-all be-all, but it matters. Um, and it's definitely part of the multimodal care that we want to give. Um, so what we're going to talk about a bit is um, what do we do, how do we go about this, um, and so non-specific low back pain, you come to us, we start the ball rolling, or hopefully you've talked about this with your primary care and they're going to have started this ball rolling. Focuses on some really basic things because most people are going to do well. Um, even though you may have back problems, 
uh, most people will get over that flare-up. They'll have a go back to the activities they love and do pretty well. For our part, when you end up invoking our care, we're going to focus on some real basic core things, uh, which we call conservative care. And and we'll talk a little bit about the data for these and, and Greg and, and Alex are going to get into some more detail. But first thing we're going to tell you is a tincture of time and rest. When you have an acute flare-up, we want you to rest. non anti-inflammatories people commonly take on their own. I just want to point out one thing that in general, if you take uh, Aleve, Ibuprofen, Naprosyn, here and there it's an analgesic. It's, uh, the drugs are meant to block a pain, uh, an inflammatory pathway and keep it blocked. So when we see, we'll often prescribe a course of them so that we block <coughs> that inflammatory pathway for one to three weeks and we keep it blocked so the inflammation actually goes down. Um, ice heat, whatever helps you, they're both effective and you may prefer one. Some people uh, in the acute injury feel like ice does better and um, heat when it's more chronic, but both are fair. Physical therapy, and we'll get, uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about the data for it. It's actually um, the best, meaning moderately good data. Uh, similarly, yoga and Pilates have great data for it. Muscle relaxers. You know, honestly, we use them, and we'll offer them, but they're, um, you know, they're fairly effective a fair amount of the time. Um, and then we'll follow you up. So one of the problems, whether this is a red flag problem and very rare, or whether this is a common problem, you know, as long as we, we are attentive to these things and we, we catch the bad problems, we address your issues in a timely manner. And um, so follow-up's important, and getting your follow-ups is important. Um, and then we, we take it from there. First, most people with nonspecific low back pain will get this um, fairly broad nonspecific workup. And then if it doesn't improve, then we'll invoke more, um, uh, more important, uh, more risky, more uh, complicated treatments. Um, so one of the things that practicing in Texas, my first job out of training was uh, joining the faculty in the University of Texas, um, and I ran their spine division for a while. They, um, the patients in Texas, I think, were really illustrative for my early practice, because I would get commonly these um, uh, Texas Hill Country people who worked farms, uh, had worked all their lives, and it was a stark contrast to some people I would see who were young, active, and able with really severe pain, but pretty benign, unremarkable imaging. And yet I'd see an old rancher or farmer who came in in their 80s, and you know they were here because they were finally in misery. They were finally about ready to tap out. They were still going to feed the cows. They were still going to do what they needed to do the next day in the field. And, and that speaks volumes to what um, just being active, being healthy, being continued motion. Motion is lotion, as we say with arthritis. And, um, and and that was just really helpful to my early learning about you know people and doing things and being active. Nothing in orthopedics, nothing in spine surgery is geared towards making you an invalid. This is the goal of what we want, um, and not and be careful because there's a lot of people out there with the it's too good to be true scenario. Um, MRIs and CT scans often requested by patients. You'll see us. Um, have a defined uh, sort of period when we'll want those. I honestly don't want you to come to my clinic in, in most cases with an MRI or a CT unless somebody's vetted you because that may be an unnecessary step in fueling the train to a surgery you'll never have or, or shouldn't have unless we sort of are too aggressive, too uh, ambitious about following these things. Um, so they're considered when um, a, you have one of those red flags, and something's ticked an alarm in my brain that I, I know that, hey, we're going to jump some steps forward and get you an MRI, a CT scan, or some advanced study. Um, if we have one of these you know, rare things that I truly suspect and know, we'll do it. If you've been vetted and now you're at a point where we actually need those things as a roadmap, we not only know, need to know what your problem is, we need to know how we're going to go about the solution. Um, and most importantly, you know, when we've tried at least some regular stuff that helps most people and it hasn't unfortunately helped you, then we're going to proceed to some conservative, uh, after conservative care to getting some advanced imaging. 
Um, and you'll find that some providers will also hold you back for seeing us, and, and honestly, for good reason. They want to send you to us when it's the right time and not sort of artificially feed this fear or desire that you might have that, well, I need to see the surgeon because, um, again, it, it might artificially push the, a ball forward that doesn't need to be in play yet. And, um, and we want to see you at the right time so we can do the most good. Um, these are some of the reasons we will. I suspect a, a severe problem like Kadokoina. I'm going to explain what that is. Um, you have some progressive weakness, progressive neurologic deficit that somebody's picked up, then I definitely want to see you. Um, and that deficit has persisted. Um, or you've done um, some conservative care, you have something like sciatica, and, and it's unremitting and progressing. We want to see you and we want to get you some relief. Cotoclinus syndrome is brought up because it's one of the few things that people um, truly should catch and be uh, uh, active and aware of, but I don't want you guys to worry about because it it's also ultra rare. Um, Cotoclinus syndrome is where a large disc herniation, a tumor, something has caused complete um, blockage of the lumbar and sacral, especially the sacral nerve roots. We talk a lot about sciatica and how, what it does to your legs and stuff, but also know that the sacral nerve roots pass by here, and they're the ones that control your bowel and your bladder function, the sensation to your genital and saddle area, and it turns out that's pretty important stuff. Um, so when they're obstructed and when they're um, completely blocked, that's, that's a surgical emergency. But fortunately, it's very rare, and it presents itself very dramatically. People have some <coughs> Uh, urinary retention or incontinence, and they never had it before. People have sudden anesthesia or can't feel their feet or their uh, saddle area. That's the time to go to the emergency department and not necessarily my clinic in four weeks. Um, spinal stenosis is another common condition you guys have probably heard and, and have an incomplete understanding of, but I just want to give you a, a little primer on it. Uh, stenosis of anything, if it's pipes in your house, it means that they've calcified and are getting narrower and, and might be causing a blockage. Stenosis in your spine means that that area where the neural stuff, the nerves and spinal cord need to pass through, are getting narrowed and choked off. And so you know it because it causes pain and problems, but, um, but it's one of the common things that we deal with. And one of these common scenarios is um, again, another uh, head nodding moment is uh, this is a pain that typically progresses as we ambulate because these areas are tight. When we get up and weight bear and walk, those spaces get even more narrowed when gravity is pushing down on them and the symptoms worsen, people's buttock pain worsens, the cramping in the back of their legs worsens, they get weak legs. And if you go to any mall on a Saturday afternoon, you'll see a lot of people, often in the six, seventh, and eighth decades, sitting on the bench like this, waiting for their grandkids. And what they're doing is they're opening up the nerves just a millimeter or two to give that more room and more uh, relief. And then that'll usually take the pain away or make it much better. They'll walk another half mile, quarter mile block before they end up in the same problem. And that's a really common s scenario or syndrome. Um, also associated with the shopping cart sign in the store people. You know, they're, they're not leaning on the shopping cart because they're lazy. They're trying to give their nerves a rest by opening up those joints just a millimeter or two. Spondylolisthesis we talked about. Um, again, very common. So, treatment. And I, I throw up um, lumbar hardware not to freak you out, but to say um, this is not where we're commonly going to end up, or hopefully don't. We're going to start with over-the-counter medications. We're going to start with physical therapy. You're blessed with a fantastic physical therapy group here, and now probably the most beautiful physical therapy uh, clinic I've ever seen. And, um, and that's a real asset. And in general, it, it, it does a lot of good. Um, injections. And sorry for how some of these slides have transferred. <clears throat> Allison and Greg are going to talk to you about um, some of those as well. I'm just going to say that, yeah, one of our next steps in the conservative um, 
the algorithm is we're going to say, you know, the basic stuff hasn't worked, but I think I know where your pain's coming from, and A, I want to help you, and B, I want to prove it, so I'm going to inject a certain area, and that injection should not only hopefully help you, they don't always, um, but they give us some diagnostic benefit. They tell us, if we go back to that L4-5 spondylolisthesis or disc herniation and we inject that L4, L4 or L5 nerve or that area and you get good relief, then we figured something out and it helps us in the way we're going to treat you. And hopefully it lasts uh, a good long time. But another question I'm going to preempt is, well, I'm getting an injection. How long is that going to last? I don't know. It's um, one of those things we, once we do, then we know, and not every injection is the same, so it's really common that you get one, and one's beneficial, and the next one uh, doesn't do so much, or we do two, and they don't do it very much, but we're still pretty confident for diagnosis, and we'll do a third, and lo and behold, you get great relief, so it's just, it's one of these things that I wish I could um, tell you an injection is good for 12 weeks of good relief, and that's not true. But it may be. Um, again, we talked about mental health, and I think, again, we're blessed in a system that is placed wellness above um, a lot of uh, other systems, and it was sort of essential when I took over the, the spine service line here to, to, to have something that incorporates wellness, mindfulness, and, and uh, mental health in our approach to spine problems. We're going to give Allie and Greg uh, um, some time to come up here and talk to you about what they do, but um, they're, you know, integral to this team. Um, and then so are, for lack of a better term, almost whatever else is out there to try. As long as there are things out there that, that we talk about, don't break the bank and make you better, I've got patients in every category that get relief from acupuncture, get relief from uh, soft tissue mobilization, um, chiropractic care is often effective, but not necessarily always. And my end disclaimer, and, and a lot of you have already heard this, if it makes you feel better, it doesn't break the bank, I am A-OK -okay with it. Um, I will stop you or, or guide you when I think there are things that are um, ill-advised or not likely to help your particular situation. Um, <laughs> So, so when, when, when do I really get involved? And granted, I'm, I'm a spine surgeon who hopes I never have to be utilized, but realizes that I'm going to have a full practice no matter what, because we're all aging. And now we're running into the baby boomers. Um, a lot of you are here. And hip, knee, back, these are all the things that all of us carry with us as we age. And you're going to be. Um, some of you will end up at the end of in, end of the line in terms of conservative care fails, and what's left is me. <laughs> uh, but it should be that because there's you know every time we open the door on something like surgery, we've now put you in a new category of new risks, <laughs> new possibilities, new um, things that can affect you down the line. And so um, I always say that there there are no doors once I open that I can close again. Um, another thing I say often is, you can always do more, we can't do less, so you'll see us work in a stepwise approach up to this because we don't want to go straight to just fix the problem, doc, do whatever you have to. Some of these things we want to, to work our way up to rather than just shock and awe and um, do the biggest thing possible. Uh, even though it may be effective, it carries other baggage with it. Um, and then once we get into details, we'll talk about, are you appropriate for minimally invasive spine <coughs> surgery? Absolutely, I do it, but that doesn't mean you're the patient for it. Uh, minimally invasive, maximally invasive, you guys don't necessarily care as long as we address your symptoms and you're a better patient at the end of the scenario. And I won't recommend something minimally invasive um, or even a big surgery if that's not right for you and the overall picture. So, yeah, we want to be able to offer everything, and we do, but at the same time, um, be careful. I can't remember if I left the Laser Spine Institute slide in here, um, but we don't, we don't want to sell you um, any Doc Watson snake oil. We want to give you what's right for you, and if that means it's through an incision this big, or 
you know, uh, I've seen some of my patients tonight that literally have an incision that big and yet all happy. I should have uh, put in um, probably the biggest surgery yet I've done in this system, uh, having come from a practice where I did very large, very complicated surgeries, just was in clinic this week and showed me pictures of her skiing in Whistler. And it's, it's, it's just hugely gratifying to say that, again, it's not the magnitude of what you go through, it's the outcome. So whether it's microscopic, whether it's um, a small incision addressing a focal problem, there's some of those in the audience, um, whether it's um, stuff that's done percutaneously through the skin, or this is uh, still one of my happiest patients from San Antonio, um, and uh, she's 84 years old and doing fantastic. I, I could put in her um, preoperative images, but you would look at that and say, how is that possible? And, the reality is, is everything else was not appropriate for this patient, and she does great. But she went through a lot of risk to get there. Um, this is another patient. Again, if you think that looks like a lot, try walking around like this for several years um, in abject misery. Um, just a few other quick little <clears throat> basics about how this works. You'll hear a lot of uh, terms. There's decompression, there's decompression infusion, there's motion preserving surgery like artificial discs. Um, the, the big categories are we're either going to remove bone around the nerves, either through little incisions or bigger incisions. Um, and if we have a stable spine, that's all you need to do. If we have other issues, a fusion may be indicated because we need to stabilize an unstable spine in order to give you relief. Um, not one of these things should be predetermined when we treat you. We're not saying like, well, I just do disc replacement, so let's find out how we're going to give you a disc replacement. I do, but I'm never going to give you a disc replacement if it's not going to do well in you. That's a cervical disc replacement. Um, and then, you know, I don't know if this really needs to be included in this talk, but, you know, up here we do um, a fair amount of um, traumatic injuries, and again, there's, um, there's a time and place for that. And if this is your spine, no matter what, you may find this to be an acceptable solution. It's very about the... I, I often hedge of whether I'm going to put images with, like, surgery in there, but you've already Googled this. <laughs> um, so, in the end, uh, understand that now we stabilize this person's fracture. Good candidate, young, healthy, with strong bone through six very small incisions that heal up nicely and um, he'll do well without a big surgery. Um, and then we place a cage because he needed it through a two centimeter incision on his side with two uh, tablespoons of blood loss. Um, and I, I make that joke about Googling um, for a reason because I know you all do it, but also be careful what you look for because again, uh, it doesn't have to be labeled snake oil to be something that's too good to be true. And um, it used to be uh, when you well, and still is when you Google minimally invasive surgery, you'll get all these um, uh, special interests that'll tell you, you know, look at what we can do through smaller incisions. But again, none of this matters if you're not the right patient for it. Um, what the Laser Spine Institute, which hopefully now all of you know is out of business, does is they had an algorithm of eight questions, and if you answered five of them positive, then they'd look at your images because they know you might be one of the patients who can get a minimally invasive decompression done and therefore fit their model of come in, get a surgery that's effective, known effective, has great results, and be gone in uh, one to three days. Uh, and just understand that when minimally invasive is invoked, there's a lot of money at stake. So some things that I want to summarize is that um, this is common. Many people are here because it happens to them. Um, we want to help you through the conservative care. We want to make sure that surgery remains your um, mechanism of last resort and that um, we're only going to offer it if, despite all the risks, despite the things that can um, come up afterwards, that we offer you more benefit than we do any of those risks. And then we'll talk to Greg and Allison.
So lotion is motion. motion yeah, I said it right. Um, if you guys have neck or back pain and want to get up and move around a little bit, like stretch in your seat, totally do that right now. Would be a good time. Thank you so much, Dr. Child. Um, it's pretty fun up being up here because Dr. Child and I went to medical school together. So it's fun being back in the same place again. Can you, can you guys can hear me okay? Better than me. My voice carries. Okay. <laughs> so, actually, is this all right still? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I'm Dr. Allison Ganong. I'm a physiatrist. And um, you've heard through some of this. Dr. Child had an amazing presentation, and I really love the education that provided. And I will jump off of that into some more detail on what my specialty can accomplish and where we come in. Um, so, physical medicine and rehabilitation is my specialty again. Um, again, very common low back pains. 60 to 90 percent of adults will have neck or low back pain at some point in their life. I'm sure some people that you or you, your loved ones have had this in the past. Loss of work, and it's the second most common um, problem that primary care physicians actually see. So the difficulties with this is that there's so many causes, as Dr. Child has illustrated, and it requires really a whole body approach. So looking at anywhere from your, your mindset to your physical being and elsewhere. So we, we also need a preventative program to really avoid the, the recurrences of low back pain and to prevent it in the first place. Um, and it takes a team approach. So spine surgeon, physiatrist, primary care doctors, chiropractors, acupuncturists, physical therapists, um, you name it, there's lots of us that can join together and we should all be coordinating our care to help you the most. Um, what we do as physiatrists, or physical medicine and rehabilitation <coughs> physician is another way to state it, and we have kind of varying names. Um, we are non-surgical specialists of the spine. Uh, we help to figure out, you know, assessment of your function to help you get back to what you love to do, as do other spine specialists. But um, we try to look at what are your overall goals in the first place when you come in to see us with low back pain. What do you need to get back into doing? What are your activities that you love? Um, is it just that you have trouble sleeping, or is it that you can't work, or do you want to go jump off cliffs and you know you can't do these things? So there's a where, who are we talking to first? And um, education, you know, huge. And I'm glad Dr. Child brought up those images and discussed the anatomy because we really go over, you know, in, in words you can understand and with diagrams and models. And I'm sure you guys are you're sick of this when I, you come see me, all the patients out there that I bring this in with me. My little buddy Gordon, we talk about the structures and the pathology in here so you can understand why and where we can help you. Um, so I have a lot of injections that we can offer. The, Dr. Uh, Burkhardt and I both um, offer interventional um, you know, injections to treat pain temporarily, to help diagnose problems as well. We can prescribe therapy and help guide the physical therapist, uh, and then prevention of surgery or referral to the surgeon when needed. That's kind of our goal. So I'll go over kind of the functional goals again. You know, it's really, uh, function may be re restored for many people with low back pain. They may be able to get back to work in their activities, and they may still have pain. So pain and function, function shouldn't be thought of it as separate things, or they should be thought of as separate things. Many people can get back with, with, to what they love to do, even with some pain. Uh, we try to manage so that they can get to that level. Um, neuroplasticity is huge, and that's kind of where the mind and body connect, where we can kind of change our mindset um, you know, of our pain perception. There's a lot of cognitive behavioral therapies that people can use. You can see psychologists and even just do this with, with um, meditation, yoga, and try to use um, imagery or distraction to kind of change your mindset and gear you into functioning again. So that's an option. Um, and we need to advise patients that pain, usually back pain and neck pain, are chronic and they will recur. Um, it's not always going to be to the degree that prevents you from doing activities, but it is something that you have to know that it, it may be there. Uh, so how do you keep, why is this important? The, the spine is so important, it is the core of, you know, of, of stability, center of balance. It actually feeds your extremities to give you connections between your brain and your extremities to function. So it's a pretty important structure. Uh, other things we do is we think about where is your pain coming from? And it can, other problems can masquerade as spine, as back pain. 
So things such as the sacroiliac joint, piriformis, the hip joint, uh, the iliotibial band, gluteal muscles, all of these structures, um, even the shoulder, all of these can, they can refer back and forth to the neck and the back. So we want to make sure we're actually treating the right problem in the first place. Uh, there's many, you know, I will skip over this because Dr. Child greatly illustrated this. Um, all of the different layers of the spine can cause pain and we'll get to some of those. Again, MRI scans can be very abnormal, although the patient um, has no pain sometimes and vice versa. So some of the interventions we can offer, we'll go through that a little bit, and um, we'll leave some time for Dr. Burkhardt to speak as well, and he'll go over some of this as well. Uh, so we have some great tools that we can help to guide injections to treat and to diagnose pain. The fluoroscope or an x-ray machine, the fancy machine that rotates around, in, around the body, we can inject um, into areas where the nerves are pinched or there's stenosis, as Dr. Child mentioned. Uh, we can deliver a strong anti-inflammatory medication called cortisone usually into this region to decrease pain temporarily. Um, it usually, you know, we say it lasts usually three to four months and some people we, we do these recurrently because it does help them function and get back to what they love to do. Other times it doesn't work at all and other times it works a lot longer than that. Uh, we use this for pinched nerves or degenerative disc problems or facet problems pinching the nerve region where that nerve goes to the arm or leg. And then uh, we also can inject those joints in the facet joints on the sides of the spine, just like a knee joint or a shoulder joint. Those joints become arthritic for a lot of people and inflamed. And we can also deliver cortisone into those joints with, with x-ray guidance with fluoroscopy. So those little rotational joints in the back, um, again, last about the same time. We can also burn those nerves, which gives you a little bit longer lasting relief. Uh, it's called a radiofrequency ablation and we basically heat the nerve up real high and kind of kill that nerve for a while. We don't really kill it, but it grows back. And so it's a temporary stunning of the nerve, we call it. And then that can give you more like six months to a year relief sometimes versus the facet joint with cortisone. Usually lasts about three to four months. Um, everybody's totally different though and everybody's mm -hmm. reactions to these injections is variable. Um, the ultrasound machine is another tool we have that we can help use to diagnose your problem. And it's right here in the office. We can do it right when you're there. We can scan and inject joints such as the hip joint or the bursa. This is a picture of a bursitis on the outside of the hip where people have that pain when they're lying on their side or when they're moving and rotating. I see something out there. Um, <laughs> so we can inject with that needle going into this space right here. That little dark area is fluid in the bursa, which is a layer of a sack of fluid basically that gets enlarged between uh, layers of structures that move and that causes a friction sy syndrome and pain. So if that helps get rid of your pain down your leg or the thigh area, then we know it's actually from the bursitis and not from your spine nerve root being pinched. So that's a good tool to use. Uh, the hip joint itself, can usually refer to the front of the leg and the groin area. And so if we use the ultrasound to guide an injection into that joint and your pain goes away, then we know it's actually coming from the hip joint, not from the spine, because the spinal nerve roots can also radiate and give you pain into the groin region. Okay, core strengthening. Maybe not the right side, maybe the left side. is a little better idea for, for the spine health. But uh, <laughs> we think about those large muscles to, um, you know, in the gym, you're working out, you want to get to that nice six pack, but you really want to work on finding those deep core stabilizing muscles, and that's where the physical therapists and um, <coughs> yoga instructors and people, um, Pilates, that can all come into play, where we really, they're tiny little stabilizing muscles around the spine that we want to target, and uh, the therapist can help you with that. So we, we work on prescribing those types of exercises, usually starting with a neutral spine program, and I'm going to just run through a couple brief pictures to show you, and you can get more instruction on how to do these and um, when and how much and how to advance these with a physical therapist and with talking to us in the clinic potentially too. Um, the spine is really meant to be in this nice curved shape to stable to, to really um, accept the loads that we go through in life. And so learning how to stabilize and get back to that postural uh, way is really important. Uh, so these are just some pictures. I'll go through it because we need to leave time for Dr. Burkhardt to chat here. 
and then there's the more, more advanced exercises that are going to be more functionally active. So um, if we have time for the end, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll answer any questions. And I want to introduce Dr. Burkhardt. Here he is. Great job, Ali. Uh, I'm Dr. Burkhardt. And I'm the newest addition to the Spine team. And thank you all um, for coming to this lecture. And I'm also an interventional pain and sports medicine physiatrist. And, Ali, and Dr. Ganong and myself both uh, do very similar procedures. So overall, um, a lot of this has already been discussed, so uh, kind of blast through a few of it. But uh, the epidemiology and etiology has been discussed. We'll talk about some common misconceptions that patients think or they read on the internet and hear from their friends. I'll talk about some more tips for preventing pain, um, and that's quite often I see in our practice. Uh, a patient comes to me, they're just getting over a flare by the time they come in, and they're doing fairly well, they're functional, they're independent, they're doing everything, pain's very minimal, but they just really want to chat about their symptoms, just get to know me, and also to kind of discuss how they can prevent this from flaring up in the future. And that is a, a good portion of my practice. So we do spend a lot of money on back pain in general. 50 to $100 billion are spent annually in the U.S. alone. A lot of money that we're spending. It's a big. Um, it does affect the majority of the, uh, the population, mostly the 35 to 50 years of age, um, and it, it's a common. It's the most common cause of job-related injury. Um, it's also one of the most common causes of people missing work. Um, in addition, besides depending on different studies, but coming to the primary care provider it might be a common cold, headache, back pain is one of the up there, maybe the top two uh, most common causes of visiting your primary care provider. Um, and uh, it's also the second most common cause of neurologic deficits in the U.S. So, um, neck pain, it's a little different, we discussed too much of this. It is most common, actually this is more the aging back, you might see more common, 35 to 50, uh, 5, and then people with neck pain, this is more the aging population, greater than 50. And neck pain, as we discussed, could be the shoulders, could be close to your shoulder blade, could be your referred pain pattern, could be headaches. Patients have, oh, I have headaches for a long time. Is it posturally? Is it stress? Is it the joints of the neck referring up? Um, a lot of different things that the neck could radiate to the arms in a radiculopathy, as, a, as our team already discussed. All right. Uh, will I have pain forever? You know, most of this, as we said, 90% of patients get better within uh, 12 weeks of, 6 to 12 weeks of good conservative management, anti inflammatories, physical therapy, core strengthening, activity modifications. Um, given a course of time, just the body has this amazing ability to heal itself, right? We're just here to help you facilitate that um, by just education, medications, and um, the body will, uh, it will take time. You see these older patients really walking over hunched. They're not in that much pain because the body is able to compensate. Um, but uh, most people will have maybe some functional, uh, maybe some pain, they'll be intermittent, they'll be able to manage it, but they should be able to get back to their functional um, uh, pre-existing functional status with physical therapy and some of the other treatments we can, call, uh, we can help you with. And then neck pain um, usually takes possibly a little longer. If it's injury trauma, it could take up to 12 months. Uh, activity is usually resolved in four to six weeks if it's um, uh, certain posture related or uh, mild injuries. So we discussed all this, but really it's protection of the spine and really the spines also hold us up, right? We want to walk straight, keep our head in, in front of us, looking at the population, make, make sure, looking out, make sure you're avoiding tripping over things. We've evolved over this, the spine has evolved with these uh, two layers of different curvatures to really keep us in an upright and erect posture. So we discussed the AG spine. Um, so again, Dr. Child uh, discussed some of these things. So if you're like, oh, you know, I want to kind of avoid further pain. Um, how are these, some of these controllable risk factors? Focusing on posture is a big component. Stress reduction, either if it's you know, prescribing a vacation, which I sometimes joke to my patients about, or you know, um, describing some of these stress reduction techniques, talking to psychologists, doing some cognitive behavioral therapy, guided imagery. I talk to patients about YouTube videos. Um, really going on there, they really help you walk through this and help kind of calm the nerves down. It might be some antidepressants that we can describe, all those are affecting stress. Um, heavy physical work, you could try to decrease the work burden, decrease the load, decrease some of the stress on the spinal elements. Sedentary work, all the opposite of that is also linked to that. If you're sitting down all day, that's also linked to it. Smoking, big common thing I try to discuss with all patients that are heavy smoker. Smoking does increase the risk uh, and accelerates the degenerative disc disease and accelerates um, the breakdown of those discs. These discs are very, they're not really, they're very poorly vascularized, they get very poor blood supply. Smoking in general. Affects all vessels, microvascular disease, small and large vessels, the heart, the brain. So really, if we get you decreasing some of these risks, you're going to get overall reduction of pain and preventing the pain. 
um, education status as well. It's been linked to a job dissatisfaction, anxiety, depression, obesity, as Dr. Child said, really I focus on big components as weight loss. I focus on diet, exercise. How can we address this? How can we get you on an exercise within 45 to 50 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise, four to five days per week? Um, and uh, good sleep hygiene as well is linked to some of these chronic pain when it's kind of diffuse. Uh, sleep hygiene is a big component as well of, um, that you can adjust. I know myself, I'm not the best sleeper, so uh, it's, it's something that we could all, all work on. Uncontrollable age, injury trauma, you can't uh, sometimes avoid accidents, sports injuries. Unfortunately, women are a little more likely to have uh, neck pain than, gen than men, um, and then some of the other um, medical conditions that you're, um, that you're either born with or their autoimmune in nature that we, we just they can't modify. We can treat them, we can't really uh, modify that. So we discuss this, we always ask a detailed history, always starts off with a um, good physical history and an exam, or history and an exam, and we ask all these detailed questions. We want to rule out those red flags that Dr. Child spoke about, um, because that's our big um, concerns. We want to get you better, most people will get better, but we also don't want to miss the, the big ones that people are scared of, cancer, infection, um, fracture, things like that. Might do blood tests, might do some advanced imaging, x-rays, MRIs, CTs, bone scans are also uh, great for looking at cancer, infection. Discography is where we put a needle in the disc, put pressure on the disc, and see if that disc is causing pain. Kind of lost favor, but now it's kind of coming back to see if this is one of the pain generators. This is multiple pain generators. Uh, and then nerve studies and EMGs, not only look if there's a nerve being pinched, could be a chronic nerve being pinched, but it also might find out if there's an entrapment neuropathy. If this numbness and tingling in your hand, is that carpal tunnel, or is this actually C6 nerve pain pinch, or C7? Uh, could be a couple of those, or the leg pain. Um, you know, a common trap of the lower extremity is the perineal nerve, which might cause numbness and tingling, top of the shin into the top of the foot, um, anterior shin to the top of the foot, right? Is that really the back, or is this another thing? So the, the nerve study is a good, valuable tool that we have to, um, to rule out uh, other causes of some of the pain. Red flags are going into detail. Oh, that didn't pop up, sorry. Um, uh, and I was like this. Okay. Anyway, so uh, basically, you guys come to your primary care provider or come to the spine center in general, um, and we'll work through some conservative management, uh, including non surgical physical therapy, exercise, occupational rehabilitation, alternative yoga, tai chi, aquatic therapy. Aquatic therapy is great. There's studies show if you do aquatic therapy and a year out, even after completing it, not even maintaining it, you'll still have a, a reduction in your pain of two. So if you have a six before you came in, dropping it down by four, two or four, it's pretty beneficial. We tried different uh, multitudes of medications, anti-inflammatories, um, nerve medications, antidepressants, muscle relaxers, mixed studies as well. Uh, we do these disc diagnostic studies. If you're not getting better or there's some red flags, or we, we might go further and dive into what's the cause of this, what's going on, what we need to figure out next. And if this will help us, one, rule out the big things, two, plan for the next step. If it's interventions, spine surgery, or, or just some answers, this is very helpful. Injections are something that we do specialize in. I, I enjoy injections. I think they're very helpful. Um, and they can be diagnostic, therapeutic as well. So that's kind of helpful for spine social planning. We work as a team, as a tight-knit team to share patients, help, uh, help mostly get better, and that's, that, that's our goal. And then if we can't fail, if, if you fail conservative management, I'm not saying fail, but if you don't get the results you want with conservative management, then surgery is an option if there's a correctable um, uh, pathology or problem with the spine. So my goal is pain relief, reducing inflammation with anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, really restore your function, get you back to uh, your full functional ability. I ask as well, what's your goal? What do you want to do? I had a lady the other day say she wants to walk 1.8 miles. 1.8 miles, why? She wanted to walk around a lake. And I understand, that was one of her goals. And that's, my goal is to do that and get her back to that level. Overall, um, prevent recurrence through education, strengthening, talking about some of these modifiable risk factors. Um, and then also improve overall back and neck strength is uh, one of the big um, proponents of prevention. So ice, heat, as needed, so collars, I don't recommend it, maybe an acute trauma center in a couple days. Bed rest, I do not recommend this. I say try to stay active as much as possible, maybe a day or two, but really it, they've looked at studies and it shows that you can look and lay in bed flat for a week versus just staying active, taking in a fun, is doing the best you can. Patients do better with uh, keeping moving. You're gonna have some pain, you gotta kind of work through it. Better will lead to depression, decrease your muscle tone, lose about 1 to 1.5% 1 of your muscle mass per day of bed rest. Pretty significant. It could also cause worsening other problems, blood clots, and legs, and mobility, um, things like that. Exercises as well as a big home remedy that you might even do on your own, stretching, gentle strengthening, and some yoga. These are a list of medications we'll all prescribe. You might be on some of them. Uh, opioids are 
usually um, maybe the short term beneficial, but long term or with um, the FDA uh, approach on opioids, it's really not something long term that we're we're using. We're using uh, interventions, mind, body, and other medications to uh, to kind of calm, uh, to reduce your pain. So physical therapy discussed, aquatic therapy as well, decreased pain, improved function, uh, spinal manipulation, come back to chiropractor. I myself am an osteopath. I look at the bigger picture. Um, some osteopaths, I'm not one of the, uh, I do not practice manipulative medicine, but these are some of the doctors or um, trained uh, practitioners that can do that. Acupuncture as well is great. Keeps the body the flow of energy, the chi going. Uh, it also releases your natural endorphins. Massage therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy might be some uh, guided imagery. Um, and uh, dietitian referral, that's a big thing I've discussed with some of my patients, really focus on weight loss through um, he healthy diet, uh, dietary modifications and exercise. And then in addition, physical therapists um, could use ultrasound laser days, use all these other modalities to kind of get you back, uh, calm down the pain in the acute phase, and then focus on strengthening and lengthening that spine. So that's our little CRM that Dr. Ganam did uh, discuss. Diagnostics, yes, it's also very helpful for therapeutic purposes. I always have a lengthy conversation about the risk and benefits. No matter what we do, anytime we uh, prescribe a medication, go to the spine through a small needle, or do a larger uh, incision and surgery with Dr. Child, there's risks and benefits. I make sure patients are aware of this. You know, unfortunately, I don't want patients to live with pain, but patients can live with pain. These are elective procedures that I am doing. So I make sure the patients are at this point in their uh, pain pathway that they're ready to take the next step. Uh, how much, how many, how often? This is debated in the field. Nowadays, we're getting better with placements and needles. The training is better, getting better. We're using x-ray. They used to do these blind, which need the landmark guided years ago. Really, we're getting the epidural space maybe one out of every three times. So that's why that kind of series of three years back in the day that was used. Now, if you're getting relief, you're getting four months, and you're not social candidate, but you're getting significant relief, we might do these every four months. Understand that there are risks. Understand that the steroid side could, could have some chronic risk, but uh, there's really no right or wrong answer when it comes to that. Promote well, function, decrease pain. Uh, we do these under x-ray guidance. Um, I also do a lot of peripheral joints under ultrasound guidance as well. Dr. Gnam does a little of these ultrasound guidance in the spine for the cervical, which is very helpful for um, her patients. Um, so some of the ones we do, trigger points, we do those in office. Uh, epidurals, a set joint, Jackson needle branch box, we all discussed that radio frequency ablation of um, That might last, you know, 6 to 12, maybe 10 to 14 months. All in all, these are great. And radio frequency ablation for this chronic axial low back or cervical neck pain, which is the set or that arthritic mediated back here. That's one of the best uh, procedures we have, one of the best studies, uh, best evidence-based procedures we have for this um, chronic axial standing and tolerant back pain. And then SI joint injection, the gold standard of that is x-ray guidance. And these are, you know, about 15% of the population have SI joint mediated pain that's sometimes overlooked. So those are something that we can help and truly diagnose this pain where it's coming from, because that's the old gold standard. Here's a couple of epidurals that we do. We look at the spine, we know the anatomy, know where the nerve roots are. Um, here's a different approach we do as well. We use dye, make sure we're in the right area, make sure we're not in a blood vessel. Uh, if we're in a blood vessel, the medication doesn't go where it wants to go. I want to make sure it's safe injection, and uh, number one. And number two, I want to get the medication in the right area to get you guys uh, ultimately relief. These injections may last one to three months. They're not usually curative. Could last short term, not at all. Could be long term. But they do give us good information. The light can in there. There's a short term effect. But that light can gives me great information if that's helpful if I'm in the right area, if I'm at that level of nerve roots, L4 versus L5. We might do some selective di diagnostic injections to make sure, one, that we're in the right area. Two, we're going to make this in, um, surgical planning, uh, minimize the extent of the surgery with Dr. Child. Here's a cervical interlaminar. We, we treat all levels of the body, neck, uh, from uh, head to tail. Here's a facet joint injection. We do also radio frequency ablation where we kind of just bathe the nerve here where it sits. Um, but overall, it's very helpful. This is the SI joint, the sacral iliac joint injection. Might have that buttock pain, worse with transitions, possibly worse with sitting. Uh, some other common procedures, uh, Dr. Child is, uh, and myself, but Dr. Child does them uh, uh, much more frequently, uh, vertebroplastic hyperplasties. These are where for these acute compression factors, these are maybe beneficial and may help. Um, there's some, uh, um, some benefit and utility doing kyphoplasty, restoring the height of that compression factor and getting you over that acute pain phase quicker. Spot cord stimulators is a new or neuromodulation field. This is something I'm um, developing with this practice and we're working it up. Um, but spot cord stimulators, the evidence is great. The newer technology, old, the older um, ones, back in the, when they started in the late 80s, early 90s, you get these parasties or ants down your legs or tingling or kind of um, numbness sensation. The newer one does not have that patient. A lot of patients can even tolerate that. 
but the future is these are very helpful for this chronic nerve type pain and some people are pushing this before surgery some are after we'll see where it kind of works out with the data and then a lot of the spinal regenerative medicine a lot of people are going into the disc, they're looking at the posterior spine, those, these ligaments, the facet joints, the muscles, they're kind of bathing in it. And these are minimally invasive, lower risk procedures that may get significant relief. These are unfortunately um, cash based procedures, but we're, a lot of doctors are putting a lot of good research out there to get, the, um, uh, to get them eventually approved by insurance so everyone could benefit. So that's a placement of the spinal cord lead. This patient also had a disc replacement, as you see, um, but we tunnel off the spinal cord stimulator and the dorsal, yeah, it looks like yours actually. Uh, but you, we have tunnel this lead in the posterior epidural space. These are the electrodes with metal contacts that stimulate that dorsal column and they get some really good uh, pain relief. In addition, it has some psychiatric effects. Patients have improved mood, less depression. Why? Because it's kind of affecting this brain to body, um, uh, mind body approach as well. Another one in the lumbar spine. Um, so man, better is the cure, as I discussed about this. No, it's not. It affects multiple things. You get bone loss, risk of clots. You get this illness mindset. I can't get out of bed. I can't do anything for myself. Big thing is muscle atrophy, and, and just you don't do better. Patients who stay active and work through the pain with pain medications uh, will ultimately do better. Pain medications use anti-inflammatory as their first line. Um, if you don't have any underlying heart disease, uh, kidney problems, or if any significant gastritis, anti-inflammatory is the course of it. Um, six to eight hundred milligrams every eight hours of ibuprofen, maybe an approximate powder every 12 hours, loxicam or some of the other prescribed, but that would be something to start with. And it would be a two to three course, kind of help you move through it. Um, and then acute, if it's severe, you know, you might get a short course of uh, some oral, ster uh, oral steroids, possible some opioids, but, um, you know, in, in, every patient is different, so. All right, as we discussed, I'm in good shape. I will never get back pain. Yes, it could be like this guy and be very strong. But we all have inherent weaknesses. The core is a complex strengthening of, uh, of uh, every bit of muscle strength you have in the core will help offload the spine. So it can affect anyone, regardless of their fitness or activity level. So yes, strengthening core will help prevent it, but you still might have the strongest core possible. You still may um, unfortunately have back pain. So it will only help prevent it, can still get it, but it's very beneficial to maintain your core from strengthening. Um, I have back pain now, Doc. Will I continue to have back pain throughout? As we said, 35 to 55. But as you look at the aging population, patients after 55 usually compensate. The body gets better, usually adjusts for some of the pain generated. So patients, patients usually have less pain when they get older. And we said an aging spine, disc degeneration, is a natural part of aging. You get some osteophytes, and you get facet disease. All this is there. You know, it's there. But it all doesn't cause pain. So prevention. Um, maintain good core strength, work on flexibility, posture is the big component, proper ergonomics. If you're at a sit desk, I'll talk briefly about that. Proper lifting techniques, nutrition diet, weight loss, quit smoking, please. If you are a smoker, this is one of the most important things I think you can do for yourself. Mental health, cardiovascular health, um, overall spine health. It, it affects every organ. It affects the lungs, the kidneys. I think it's one of the, um, the worst habits to, to pick up. And if you are, try to do your best to talk to your primary care, talk to us, and uh, try to get off the uh, tobacco. So one thing, if you're at a sedentary, uh, if you are at a desk, a couple things you could do to prevent this, right? If you're looking at your monitor like this all day, you're going to be straining this posterior element of the spine. If you're hunched over with your arms up and your hands, you're going to be setting yourself up a carpal tunnel. So if you have any questions, you can Google. It's called OSHA guidelines, um, and this is produced by the government. And o overall, you want to have 90 degrees of the knee joint, feet flat on the floor, good lumbar support, about 90 degrees at the elbow, wrist in a neutral position at about 10 to 15 degrees tilted down. These are, this is one of the best setups you can have. You don't want to be looking at your monitor this way all day because you're going to stress other aspects of the neck. This is a very important setup. So if any of questions over after, please uh, let me know. And sit up straight, of course. Uh, engage the core. Another thing, tip, tips, tips for lifting heavy objects, right? You don't want to be this guy. You're going to be putting a ton of pressure on that L4, 5, and L5, S1 disc. You want to bend with your knees, keep the object in tight. You want to have a good posture, keep the neck in line with the spine. What else can you do? You could use tools. You could use straps. You could use lifting aids like dollies. Friends, recruit a friend. Recruit someone in the community. I had a patient the other day who was like, I just, I keep getting back pain because of shoveling. I'm like, go hire a young kid. Go hire the neighbor. Go do what you need to do. I was like, you know, I'm just be friendly. In, in, People will assist you. You know, if you need it, there'll be assistance out there. Just ask for it. You know, lighten the load. Take a few things out of the box, then lift it every little bit. Um, 
You're not placing it in a low position. If you gotta lift it and you're gonna be lifting from A to B, put it in, you know, maybe put it on the other box. Don't go down every time and do the same position. Lift at the knees, engage the core, and uh, keep close to the body. So overall, my mantra, I am an interventional pain and sports medicine physiatrist. Cultivating, facilitating functional improvement in patients with disabilities, acute or chronic, no matter what it is, I try to improve your overall quality of life. I do injections. I absolutely love injections. I think they're the most, that's why I have a reason why I got in the field. I was a, a med, I was actually an undergrad, seeing my cousin do a lot of these findings, and I'm like, this is great. I see the patient, they come in, it's kind of a puzzle, we figure out what's going on, use advanced imaging, I'm seeing the injections, I'm seeing the follow-ups, I was like, this is amazing. That's what brought me to it. But overall, I don't use these first line at all, guys. I try to talk to my patients, I educate them first, I do all exhaust, all conservative before I move into it. If they're in acute pain and they can't get through physical therapy, yes, that's an option to move forward um, and start doing uh, some injections ahead of time to really calm this down. And again, we have the great innate ability to heal itself, we'll regenerate some tissues, um, and uh, no patient or treatment algorithm is the same. No matter who you are, patient A, B through Z, everyone I tailor it to the patient's needs, financial abilities, what they can do, if, if it's getting to physical therapy, maybe doing home exercise, whatever it is, medications, limitations, I talk to it all, and I gotta sometimes think out the side of the box. It's like, I'm not into medication, doc, which I understand, I completely understand. It might be a more holistic approach, it might be some turmeric I prescribe, um, might be some of these over-the-counter salon pots, maybe lidocaine, a little less systemic absorption. So we gotta think and work as a team. And really, when you come to me or Dr. Ganon, we work together, right? This is a relationship, it's not just one-sided and we'll help you get through this. Again, back and neck pain are common. There are many causes of back pain. Most people get better with conservative management, about 90% of 12 weeks. Fluoroscopic interventions are very helpful to alleviate pain or sore function, and they're also great for surgical planning or for diagnostic purposes. And prevention is key. If you have pain, comes and goes three to four episodes a year, try to prevent this by modifying the risks and modifying the, um, uh, the causes of it. Um, thank you guys, and I'm in Carson and, and uh, the center, and my phone number if you need anything, and my email, I'm here for anybody for questions. Okay. Thank you guys.